I am not afraid of heights. The way that I know this is based upon the number of adventures that I've had during my travels. I have climbed to the top of the Sydney Harbor Bridge. I have gone zip lining through the rainforest in the Dominican Republic. Back before I had my son in the days when I was much, much smaller, I went to the Forbidden City and I climbed as far as I could go on the Great Wall of China. I have even been to the lookout point in what some people would call the majestic dungeons in Ghana, West Africa, and for me it was an oxymoron because I knew that right below was the door of no return. I have also been to the Eiffel Tower, and I did not climb to the top of it, but from this perspective, I could see just how high it actually was. For some people, you can get a high from standing in line for hours to see the Mona Lisa. It is the only piece of art that has two 24-hour security guards. I've seen it, and believe me, it's not as big as you think it is. It's actually kind of small. I have also been to the Baj Khalifa, which is the tallest recorded building in the world. And I've been to the lookout point for that. And I have gone through the sand dunes in Dubai. So all of these things, in my opinion, would make me seem that I am not afraid of heights, either figuratively or literally. But there are people who are afraid of heights. It causes nausea, dizziness. It causes some people to feel afraid because they're uncertain of exactly what it is that they're doing. And then you have those people who live for adventure. They're not scared. They actually get an exhilarating feeling from it. Now, based upon this next picture, would you say that this person is afraid of heights? Probably not. And to be hanging upside down in a forest from a rope, you cannot be afraid of anything. So my question to you today is, of what are you afraid? I taught at a HBCU in Alabama. And for those of you who are uncertain, an HBCU is a historically black college or university. And this is the question that I would ask my students all the time of what are you afraid? I would get into a discussion about, oh, have you been out of the country? Where have you been? What type of things have you done? And my students, who are primarily minorities, would say, we haven't been anywhere. Why not? Because they were afraid. There are some apprehensions to travel. Now those apprehensions, like I said, definitely is fear. There's the fear of the unknown, fear of the things that they cannot see. I say that some of the things we actually do know can be scarier than those things that we don't know. There's separation anxiety. And for a lot of students who are the breadwinners for their families, are afraid to be away from those family members. You also have the concern about finances. First generation college students who have not had the experience for anyone else in their family to graduate from a two-year or a four-year institution are more concerned about how will they finance their studies than they are concerned about how will I pay to go outside of the country. Then there are the misconceptions. There are the misconceptions that the place that they go will be dangerous. The place that they go might be dirty. The place that they go, they may not be able to communicate with others there. I taught in China and I actually had an interpreter the entire time that I was there. And then I went to other countries that were English speaking countries. But what stood out to me more than anything was the misconception that minority students believe that traveling abroad is only reserved for the, for the majority population. What is it about a minority student that says they cannot go from here to there, wherever there might be? If you look at the statistics about 
that generally travel abroad by their race, the numbers are strikingly low. It does show that it is primarily Caucasian students that travel. The percentages are essentially in the single digits. And fortunately, the numbers have risen. They've gone up 3.8% in 2015, 2016, from 313,000 to a little over 325,000. 3.8% in these numbers may seem big, but let's say, for instance, you went to a restaurant and, and the waiter said, today, I'm going to give you 3.8% more meat in your burger. You might be excited about that. But for those of you who use public transportation and depend on the train to run on schedule, running on time 3.8% of the time each day is not going to work for you, is it? And what if your boss came to you and said, today I've decided to make some changes, and I'm only going to give you 3.8% of your check this month. 3.8% does not seem like a big number. 40% of companies have said they've missed out on so many opportunities because their employees do not have the business acumen of international or global understanding. So these numbers are staggeringly low. And what I said to myself is, what am I supposed to do? What is my role in this? How can I get my minority students to have better global exposure and to understand that if they are in the fear, the finance, and the misconception mindset, that they too have an opportunity to do what their counterparts do. So in 2014, I coined the phrase, hashtag, get a passport and go. And essentially what that says is, there is nothing and no one that can stop you from getting to point A to point B if you have this little blue book in your hand. This is a copy of my passport, and I'm very proud of it because it has stamps from all of the different places that I have been. My goal is to set foot on every single continent, and I have South America and Antarctica left. I'm still on the fence about whether or not I want to go to Antarctica, but in the meantime, it is on my list. And I want my students to understand that they have those same opportunities that I have had. One, two colleagues, Rhonda Jackson and Renee Loper, what we have looked at is Crathwall's effective domain. The cognitive domain processes, but the affective domain really looks at the sensitive needs of students. How can you tap into what they need and what their experiences are? And what we have determined is that mentoring is key. As I said, that first generation students who have not ever had the opportunity to get outside of their comfort zone before. So a strong mentor is going to be crucial to these students. They have to say, look, there is someone that I admire, someone that I look up to, someone who is doing things I want to do. That mentor is going to have to mold these students and have engaging activities in service learning. Service learning and cultural immersion experiences will be like mock situations that will put the students in their locale and have them do situations or do things that would replicate what they may do abroad to get over those fears and to understand that in terms of finances, there are scholarships available. But a mentor is going to be the one who's going to help that student tap into those financial opportunities and help the students see that they have a greater purpose outside of their comfort zone. I have also told my what I'm going to tell you today, and that is, I want you to fly. I don't want you to fly in the sense that my seven-year-old son does. Now, he firmly believes that he is a superhero, and he can do absolutely anything, but that's why I him, that he can fly. I want to tell you today that you can also fly. And the first way that you do that is to 
face your fears. Now, this is in the sense of it doesn't necessarily have to be with you going out of the country. It can be that one thing that whenever you're confronted by it, it gives you pain or anxiety. You need to step right up to that fear, look it square in the face, and push it out of your way because there is nothing stronger, there is mightier than the God that we serve who can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we imagine. What you need to do in order to try is you're going to have to let go of your negative influences. I want you to think about the team that you have. When you share your dreams and your aspirations with the people who are around you, do they encourage you or do they kind of act like the negative Nellies that say, well, I'm not so sure about that. When I share with my friends and family that I was accepted to this talk, my friends asked, how could they help me prepare? announcement on social media. They bought tickets and they came to me. They supported me in every way possible. If you don't have a team that is going to support you and be your cheerleader, let go of that negative influence because you can't fly. They will clip your things and you can't fly. They will stow away in your luggage compartment and be extra baggage and you can't fly. And the next thing need to do is you must refuse to yield. When we surrender, yield. When we think about all of the things that may be holding us back, we yield. When we raise the white flag and don't fight, we yield. When we turn back and go the direction that we came, we yield. What you need to be able to do is face your feet. Let go of your negative influences and refuse to yield so that you can fly. So my students hashtag got their passports and they went. They went to Fiji. They went to Bali. They went to the Saudi desert. They have been to the tombs. They have been to Europe. They have done all these things and they are still going because they intend to fly.